In just a moment, keys to the capital. But first, Western Adventure, the beat of hooves, the crack of a six-shooter. They're yours on most of these stations tomorrow evening with the NBC series about Frontier Days, Six Shooter, starring James Stewart. And another Thursday adventure favorite is Jason and the Golden Fleece. And McDonald Carey stars as a wanderer of the high seas who finds intrigue and romance wherever he goes. It's an adult and unusual series. Jason and the Golden Fleece, tomorrow and every Thursday. And by the way, there's comedy, too, in your listening lineup every weeknight with Fibber McGee and Molly. Now stay tuned for Keys to the Capitol. What's going on in Washington? White House, the point of focus is troubles multiply. Congress fears Russian beachhead in South America. The ups and downs of Senator McCarthy. Life in Washington, outside the government, goes on about as usual. From Washington, NBC News brings you transcribed Keys to the Capitol, the news of the week, and what's behind it. Tonight you'll hear Ray Scherer, Earl Godwin, Richard Harkness, and David Brinkley. NBC News has given these men the weekly assignment of going through Washington's official doors to learn the background of our national policies. We bring you now Keys to the Capitol. And first, here's NBC White House correspondent Ray Scherer. Of course, that's the important thing. I think we might get this thing underway by talking a minute about the man who is at the vortex of all these problems, President Eisenhower. We might ask the question, how was he holding up under the pressure of events? This morning, the president called congressional leaders from both sides of the aisle to the White House, and they heard the bad news firsthand from Beetle Smith. Geneva in the impasse over any negotiated solution to both Indochina and Korea. Here in our own hemisphere, there is a nasty situation in Guatemala. Some of our Latin American neighbors are even blaming the uprising on the United States, claiming we had a hand in it. Some people think we should actually take a hand in it and shore up the anti-communist forces. Here at home, what people around the White House call the McCarthy problem persists. The word seems to be out to give in no further to Senator Joe, but officially the president keeps the loop. Privately, his attitude is something quite different. The president's big preoccupation is his legislative program. He talks about it every chance he gets. He did so last night. The president has said that if Congress does not pass a sufficient portion of his program, the Republican Party does not deserve to remain in power. At the moment, there is doubt how much can be passed between now and the end of July. But it isn't all gloom around the White House. On the credit side, the business situation is looking a little better. Certainly, it's no worse. The president was delighted to see Senator Margaret Smith win by a whopping majority as the Republican contender in Maine. The president was much cheered at the tremendous reception he got from the Citizens for Eisenhower convention here a week ago. Up until then, he seemed a little... Well, a little irritated about things, but here was the enthusiasm of the campaign all over again. It gave the president a big morale lift, and it gave Mrs. Ike one, too. I watched the president tee off on the golf course at Quantico last week with a bunch of old friends from service day. She hit a long drive. The gallery, marine officers, and their wives clapped. And the photographers cried, do it again, Mr. President. Ike said, oh, you want me to prove the first one was an accident? He hit a second golf ball again long and down the middle. Now, I tell this to make the point that he seems to be in fine shape physically. But when he gets back to the White House, there are all these problems. Dick Harkness, how do you think the president is holding up? Well, I think he's holding up very well, Ray, uh, and uh, is on top of most of these problems. I, I do feel, however, this is a personal reaction, a political comment, that uh, the president better get a hump on and, and move in, make some plans to do campaigning this fall. Because I'm convinced, and this comes from talking to members of both sides on the Hill, that if the election were held today, that the Democrats would capture at least 40 seats in the House, and it would be nip and tuck on the Senate. There's a somewhat ironic twist there, I think. In 1952, you know, the Republicans campaigned, and I think won a lot of votes, on their uh, slogan of clean up the mess. Well, now, we've seen more recently in New York under Governor Dewey the horse uh, race scandal, uh, the death of former Governor Harold Hoffman of New Jersey, ad admitting that he embezzled $600,000. So uh, let me suggest that the Democrats now have their slogan for the November campaign, which is bring the rascals back. <laughs> you think all this means that Ike's got to go to work? I certainly do. Well, you know, he's going out to Denver around the 1st of August and stay through September ostensibly for a vacation, but I think you'll find that he's going to spend a lot of time out of Denver uh, touring around the country making these so-called non-political speeches, but the, the candidates will be appearing on the platform, and I suspect he's going to talk about his program. 
Earl, do you have any thoughts uh, on all this? Uh, on this particular subject, that, yeah. That, yeah, I'd like I'd like to inject an observation. It certainly may be from ignorance on the subject. He speaks of Democrats bringing in forty seats. Was it about well, forty I seats? Have, I have t- I have heard all the Republicans in Congress, all that I know, tell how wonderful it, things are going, and yet I haven't heard a Republican out of Congress, a Republican voter who hadn't told me he's very much discouraged. I don't get. I don't understand whether the Republicans in Congress have their ear to the grassroots or what? I can't. I can't quite make it out. It's very confusing. Well, a lot of them lately have had their ears to the telephone, sir. Well, <laughs> they've had their eyes on the television. Is what? That uh, it? What do you think would happen if the Democrats got a majority this fall? How would Eisenhower fare then? Do you think? How do you do as well or better as he's doing now? What I do, do you think? I do too, because uh, you can take almost every piece of major legislation that's been passed in this Republican Congress by the. Uh, uh, Democrats, you have that uh, strange scene in the Senate today. Yeah, that's, of, that's uh, 23 Democrats are backing the Eisenhower Reciprocal Trade Program, the three-year program that the president really wants, and the Republicans are, are fighting the president on the issue. He's got a Democratic program out. Well, John, John McCormick says that there's a lot of the new and fair deal in it. Yes, that's right. It's all certainly the, not very different from the from the Democratic program, if at all. Mm-hmm. No, and strangely enough, the things that I think will appeal to the voters uh, this year to bring back the Republicans are are, are so-called liberal legis- pieces of liberal legislation, like expansion of Social Security and and the President's slum clearance housing program. Those are out of the Democratic book. Yeah. It hasn't been many years since that was described as a piece of pure socialism. Right. You remember that? Yeah, the Democrats are in an almost embarrassing position. They they, they they want to win, of course, this fall, but if they do, then the onus is on them. Uh, they got to cooperate, and if they don't, then the president can say, well, it was the Democrats that stymied me, just as uh, Truman talked back in that uh, do-nothing uh, Congress phase. Well, actually, an opposition Congress is not too bad. The late Mr. Roosevelt had one. Mr. Truman had one. Uh, I think perhaps the balance works all right. It's uh, no great tragedy, certainly, for the country. No, it's not very. It's not a good situation for getting new legislation passed. But uh, opposition congresses have never let the president down on really important things like foreign affairs and appropriations for necessary things. We've never had any real impasse, at least not lately, because no. of an opposition congress. I think you could take the line and argue it rather successfully that that Congress perhaps should be an opposition congress because here you have the president who represents the nation. And then you have your Congress made up of a lot of blocks of local interest. So it, it may not be a bad thing. Well, gentlemen, it strikes me that the thing on a lot of people's minds these days is uh, is Guatemala. What, what's this all about? Earl, you've got some thoughts on that. Well, my very abrupt thought is that Senator Lyndon Johnson of Texas, who was a Democratic leader, by the way, phrased the crisis perfectly yesterday when he said this Guatemala situation had reached a semi-military phase, because I thought it was a military matter for a long time, and the full stage, if that's correct, would be a military base for the Reds in Guatemala. That's just a few bombing hours from uh, the Panama Canal in one way and the Texas oil fields in another. And that analysis or that statement of uh, Lyndon Johnson's leaps right over the general gobbledygook and puts the situation, I think, more clearly before the people than any other and other members of the Senate come right along with him. And one of them is uh, Senator Wiley of Wisconsin, who's chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And then there's Senator Nolan of California, a Republican Senate leader, and Alex Smith, senator from New Jersey. They're both on the Foreign Relations Committee. Several members of the House in the past few years have made speech after speech calling attention to just this thing that's building up in Guatemala, and one of the first that I can recall was from Senator John McCormick, uh, Representative John McCormick of Massachusetts, when he was the floor leader in the House, and he pinpointed that situation, and others have done so more than once, and uh, I remember a couple of years ago, after one of those House speeches, I asked one of the nation's very highest diplomatic officials, what about the inside story on Guatemala? And he said, it's too bad for me to talk about it. But I think that no matter what the outward aspect is in this Guatemala thing or any other matter that has to do with the Russian Communist Party, remember that the Russian Communist Party is, I think, an arm of the Russian military. We've seen what happened in Czechoslovakia and Poland and Hungary and China and Indochina. They go in there and make their sales talk and get the people all excited about getting something for nothing. And first thing you know, there's a communist government in there, which is a military matter and is... uh, 
responsible for the expansion of military power around the world. Now, in Guatemala, the Communist Party itself has been taken over entirely by the Russian Moscow School of Instruction. Wiley, Senator Wiley, whom I mentioned, has publicized spot after spot in the higher echelons of the Guatemala government where Russian trained Reds have taken office in policy-making power jobs. And one detail of interest, there's been plenty of them, but here's one. While the North Koreans were torturing our captured soldiers, trying to force false confessions regarding biological warfare, in Guatemala, the government was sponsoring Russian propaganda motion pictures carrying on this same baseless lie. There's a lot more of that. There's a, you could talk about it really for a year every day but the situation is just leading up to a military impasse one way or the other and that's why these members of congress are leaping over diplomacy and saying we got to put up a sign keep off the grass and your point yeah. Earl, is that this isn't new this is something that's been building up for some time and we should have known it was coming uh, our dip our officials knew it was coming but it has been building up for a long time and it's more than diplomatic and it's more than a what we used to call in the comedy days a banana republic <laughs> revolution. Down behind the banana curtain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, there, the Earl, the point you make, I think, is very good. That we paid all too little attention to Central and Latin America. On the other hand, uh, Mr. Atchison and then Mr. Dulles have been so completely wrapped up in problems in Europe and Asia that they simply haven't had the time uh, to give uh, attention down there. One point that struck me, that since the war... We've poured out, I think, from this country some 25 billions of dollars around the world in loans, grants, mostly yeah. in grants. Out of that stupendous total, less than one-half billion dollars has gone to Latin and South America for economic aid down there. Now, communism does thrive in these inferior living standard countries. And I, I think we've got to pay more attention and give them some more economic aid down there, or else this communism is, go is going to become a very real and virulent problem. Well, Dick, doesn't it? Uh, wasn't it true that uh, uh, George Marshall, who's Secretary of State, and other high officials have called attention to that thing, and nothing happened much about it, except that we have bound up in some kind of organization several South American republics that don't want to be communists anymore, and you and I do. That's right. That's right. But we haven't. We have. Uh, well, it isn't always a matter of choice, is it, Earl? Yeah. The no. Russians would like nothing better than to have South America, Central America, infested with communism doing their best to promote it wherever I, they can. I, I think it's high time, and we made it our, our danger number one. And, and we point up the Monroe Doctrine. Yeah, okay. re absolutely. And in well, these days, you know, the last time we used any force of the Monroe Doctrine historically, I think it was way back in Cleveland's time when he ordered some gunboats out on the West Coast. Now, they, we can't get away with just having a few gunboats go around. We've got to be ready for a showdown and a fight if necessary. It's the only way. It's the only thing those Reds understand. It's, uh, that's, that's absolutely right, Earl. Yeah. Well, I guess at your lodge at the U.N. the other day made a little speech that sounded something like the Monroe Doctrine. He told the Russian ambassador to tell his people at home to stay out of South America. That was very First, good. That's just a talk. verbal threat. I don't know how far we're prepared to go to back that up, but he said it. We were, it sounded pretty good. Talking a moment ago about this being a banana republic war, which uh, provokes me to ask two questions. One, is anybody being killed in this war? And two, who is financing the, uh, the Guatemalan rebels? Who's, uh, who's supplying them? Anybody have any ideas? Well, it's a good question. The uh, government, of course, the established government of Guatemala claims the United States is, and we deny it. I've no doubt that we hope they'll win. Well, if you, I suppose if we really had a showdown on that thing and we talked, we talked out loud, we'd get our ears pinned back by some, something or other, but I would not be surprised if we would find that somebody is instigating the thing and that somebody is seeing to it that the rebels got arms. Well, well they certainly have them. That's, that's them. very clear. It, uh, they, they obviously were supplied in and through uh, Honduras and El Salvador. Yeah. That seems very clear. Well, well, we shipped a lot of stuff to yeah, Honduras we recently. Stuff. We shipped some arms to Honduras recently. Well, and now that it is a military matter, if the rebels, who are the anti-communists, don't win, it's going to be quite a mess, isn't it? Oh, well, yes. I, I, I think that uh, it, it will be a great setback for our prestige well, in Latin America unless our, our men win. Yes, David. Well, I had heard a couple of days ago that the Guatemalan army as we all know, is a big and fairly well-armed one for South America, that if it remains loyal to the government, the rebels stand very little chance of winning. Had you heard that? Or? 
Anything? Yeah, apparently these rebels thought that a, a lot of the people and the army would come over to their side, and I think that is the big question at this point. Are they going to? If not, it looks like they might go down the drain. Well, the Guatemalan peasants have been uh, promised to have all the land in the world that they haven't had before, so I imagine they're going to stick by the Reds. Well, gentlemen, while we've been on a fight down in Central America, I wonder if we couldn't get to a, a fight here a little closer to home. Uh, we right, got on, <laughs> right on Capitol Hill. I was very interested to, to read this morning, <coughs> pardon me, to read this morning's Gallup poll on, on Senator McCarthy, uh, the good Dr. Gallup, polled by age groups, by educational levels, professions, by parties, and even by faith. And he came up with this conclusion. His overall average showed these statistics. Pro-McCarthy, 34%. Unfavorable to Senator McCarthy, 45%. And no opinion, 21%. Now, it should be brought out, of course, that while President Eisenhower's popularity is still high, that's tapering off, too, somewhat. Now, of course, this Gallup sounding is, is not final by any means, because we must see what the investigating committee reports around the 1st of August, or rather what Republican and Democratic reports come in on Senator McCarthy and his row with the Pentagon. Uh, it's true, too, that there's another issue that is bound to crop up from time to time and, and will cause a whole running series of fights uh, uh, with Senator McCarthy. That is the issue that the senator chose to make himself. His right, his demand, as he put it, to secret confidential material of the executive branch of our government. Now, in this fight, there will be, of course, side personalities beside Senator McCarthy, Attorney General Herbert Brownell, Jr., and his Deputy Attorney General, Mr. William P. Rogers. Rogers held, as you'll recall, that now famous meeting last January 21st in the Justice Department where the anti-McCarthy strategy was set and where Army Counsel John Adams was advised to keep a record of his telephone calls of uh, in Ray G. David Shine with Roy Cohn and with uh, Francis Carr. Uh, McCarthy, you remember, too, tried to get an account of that session into the investigating committee record. The executive branch refused, and there was a real <coughs> knockdown and drag out for several days on that. So on this legal point, we'll hear more from Mr. Brownell and his young deputy, Bill Rogers. I'd say right as of now, the key or swing man, and so perhaps the most interesting individual in this whole case, is Senator Charles Potter, the young Republican from Michigan. He's the one who ended the hearing with a demand for a house cleaning of the committee and of the Pentagon, and Potter insisted that someone was lying and should be prosecuted before a federal grand jury. Now, that still is a possibility. Uh, Potter holds, then, the balance between the other three Republicans on the committee and the other three Democrats. He can swing the report either way, or if he doesn't like the Republican or Democratic report, he might very well write one of his own. I think that the most significant development since the hearing, and there's been a lot of talk, is the invitation to Senator Potter to call at the White House and see President Eisenhower and Sherman Adams. Uh, a move, obviously, to keep starch in Senator Potter's determination to see some definite conclusion in this case, and from the administration's standpoint, to see an anti-McCarthy conclusion to this case. You think mm -hmm. they uh, they backed his position when he when, when he stopped there? Uh, part of that isn't the president. Well, uh, uh, as you know, Ray, uh, being there at the White House that day, yeah. the senator wouldn't say he wasn't there. Uh, but uh, uh, I talked to him later, and uh, he expressed it this way. He says, "I'm very happy." Well, so he certainly got backing in his position. That seems to be it. Well, sure. Probably they would not have invited him to the White House if they had not, uh, if they had opposed his position, would they? Uh, no, well, I think that's, that's right. Uh, a point which we might remember there, uh, everybody was so surprised at Senator Plotter's uh, final outburst. Yet, if you'll think back, the day that the Pentagon charges against McCarthy came out and then the McCarthy Cone countercharges came out, Plotter issued right at the outset a very stiff statement in which he said that. Obviously, somebody is lying in these charges and countercharges, and it's the committee's job to find out. So he really has been consistent in his opening statement and his closing statement. Did you say that it's the committee's job to find out? The committee's job uh, to find uh, out. What they're doing now with Ray, with Ray Jenkins lining up the facts and then the committee going over them. Well, if the committee, if, if the Department of Justice brings, uh, prosecutes anybody for perjury of this thing, I'm just wondering if any American jury isn't going to have just as tough a time trying to uh, get an indictment or get a conviction as the committee is in getting a report. I think it would be very difficult. Very difficult. I wouldn't think it would be as difficult because before a jury in a courtroom, you have got to stick to the facts 
And when there is an objection which is upheld by the judge, you shut up. You don't continue to ramble on about side issues. Do you think you could pick out any American jury in a hurry that wasn't prejudiced on this thing one way or the other? Probably not. I that's imagine this would be a tough one to find I, I, anyone who's... Well, right. if the Gallup polls right, there's 21 percent of the people who have no have opinion. No so, uh, so maybe you get one out of five. <laughs> it can't be 21 percent of the people never heard of McCarthy. Oh, no. No. Uh, uh, no, if it is, it's not Senator McCarthy. No, but McCarthy's it is an fault. awfully difficult matter, isn't it? Well, it's of course a, it is. You can't, you can't. Is. I've often heard people say the president ought to do something about it. Well, he can't do very well, much about it that would be definitive or uh, end it all. No, the hearing transcript has gone to the Justice Department, and attorneys uh, presumably are studying the record for perjury. It's all through there. Uh, obviously, somebody's lying. But the question is, that the Justice Department must have to decide who is lying. Well, I have talked to a Department of Justice official on the subject of perjury, and they tell me that to prove perjury or for them to bring, to bring in a... To bring it to, to, to the attention of a grand jury, there must be at least two witnesses that could prove that the man was lying. And in this particular case, that's it doesn't, the difficulty. Seem, but there doesn't seem to be to be any two. It would be very hard to prove very because difficult. the thing very is so difficult. cloudy and confused and there's so many references, as everybody in the world knows, to my recollection is... And if it's proved false, he could say, well, my recollection was wrong. And yeah, it isn't right. Yes, uh, Senator Jackson, the Democrat from Washington, tried to pin down both mm -hmm. sides. Remember, he would read the Army charges to Roy Cohn and say true or false. Yeah. He'd read the, the McCarthy Cohn charges to the Pentagon people and say true or false. One thing that struck me was, was uh, that day that Roy Cohn was on the stand, and uh, uh, he said that he thought that uh, Stevens was mistaken. Secretary Stevens was mistaken in what he said. And uh, uh, Jackson kept pressing him, do you think that he perjured himself? And uh, Cohen said, no, I don't say that. I don't know what was in his mind. I merely say he was mistaken. It, it's a very messed up, uh, unclear transcript. I, I, I would hate to try to bring charges against anybody. I wonder if we couldn't talk in a minute about the <clears throat> political effects of the hearing. For the most part, it seems to me they were, they were good. And while it may have... Shocked some people to see a bunch of senators wander around so much, spend so much time with irrelevancies. The hearings did give people a fine chance to make up their mind about Joe McCarthy. Up until now, it seems to me, Joe has been for many people a symbol, a symbol of anti-communism, the man who does something about subversion. But the hearings brought out Joe the man. Day after day, people could see how he worked, what kind of a man he was, and the people could make up their minds. Now, I think a lot of people decided he was a bully, and people, for the most part, don't like bullies in America. On the other hand, the, the stalwart McCarthy backers are saying, more power to him, he's a fighter, we saw him fight, and we like him more than ever. So it seems to me one important thing was the chance for people to make up their minds. It was that, as you say, the people, most of the people I've seen who are really hot for Senator McCarthy don't care what he does. You can point out any kind of shortcoming. You can say he's a bully, you can say this or say that, and they say, all right, he's a bully, he's this or that, but he's after the communist, isn't he? Yeah. And that uh, is taken as an answer for all shortcomings. Well, if you fellow, uh, were you through there? Uh, yes, if you, if you all had the, had the, had the opportunity to, to read or listen to Pat McCarran, senator from Texas yesterday, uh, he, uh, I think he is uh, generally on the, on the McCarthy side as far as the investigation of subversive is concerned. And Pat made a long speech, and the gist of it, as I got it, was that these hearings have unfortunately given a black eye to congressional investigations generally, that, that folks, folks have, uh, have begun to look down on them entirely, which is, which is unfortunate because they certainly do have to have congressional inquiries and investigations into, into very many phases of, of American life. That's well, not, when these senators made their swan song speeches the last day of the hearing, it seems to me they all very carefully said, well, now, this isn't a typical hearing, and you mustn't judge it by this. They were well, people don't know that. No, but those are about ten words out of yeah. two million. Yeah, yeah. 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 said he thought that the effect was good. I thought it, the hearing was a great obscenity and a disgrace to this country and its government. And you watch it every day, don't you? We've... Uh, We've been talking here about the atmosphere in Washington these days and about some of the things, the important things that are worrying the president and the people. We've more or less covered them. There's one more part of this story about the Washington atmosphere I'd like to skim over briefly before we go, and that is the atmosphere in Washington, not particularly as the capital, but merely as a big city where people live and work and play. When the Republicans first came in, there was a lot of talk about house cleaning and reduction in force and 
firings of worthless masses of government employees and all kinds <laughs> of conversation along that line. We re all remember it. Well, as we've seen, this is mostly just conversation, political campaign conversation. Some people have been fired, a few thousands, but also some have been hired. And now, in perspective, this house cleaning, so far as firings are concerned, did just didn't amount very much. When the talk first started, the merchants here in town couldn't sell, uh, couldn't sell a refrigerator or a television set for love nor money because so many people were unsure of their jobs. But that's pretty much over now, and nobody here is very much worried about it anymore. People in Washington, government employees and the rest of us, are back to what we might call something like normal, buying houses in Maryland and Virginia suburbs, riding to work and back on Washington's rubber-tired streetcars, buying refrigerators on the installment plan, behaving just about like people everywhere else in the United States. The government has a great many women employees of all ages. The government girl is more or less famed in song and story and movie plot in this country, and she now is carrying on about as usual. These, these girls, the younger ones in particular, who haven't yet got into the higher income brackets, almost invariably rent apartments around town on Connecticut Avenue, 16th, Massachusetts, in Virginia, Maryland. And uh, usually they share it with another girl. They split the rent and they take turns cooking. And they, they get out at night, no more, no less, than girls anywhere else. But I think in this town there is a little less big spending in the nightlife than you'd find in some other towns. And this is primarily because it's a medium income city. We don't have too many wealthy people here, but at the same time we don't have very many extremely poor people. The income generally is what you'd call medium or middle. The big spenders here are, are the lawyers. This seems to be a very lucrative town for lawyers, for businessmen and companies with expense accounts putting on parties and lobbyists who seem to thrive here. They have parties at their homes and cocktail parties at the hotels around town, which are very famous all over the country. That, uh, that is about the only big spending here. The government employees generally, as I say, are of medium or middle income, and they are living now what would be a more or less normal life anywhere, right? Well, Dave, uh, you know the tourists spend a lot of money here, and, and for my part, I never, I never fail to be amazed by Washington, this capital of ours, as a tourist mecca in the summer. As we all know, the humidity stays at 99 for weeks on end, but the people, they flock here by the carload, and the hotels are constantly filled up, and the motels have out there no-vacancy signs. Now, every morning by the White House, I see hundreds of people standing in line along East Executive Avenue waiting to traipse through the White House, which they do. The tour takes about 15 minutes, and I suppose it's the grandest thing you can do in Washington. Some people go through over and over again. They just can't get over the thrill of being permitted to tour the mansion where the president lives. Now, Ike, on the other hand, gets away from the place every chance he gets. He takes Mamie with him, drives up to Camp David and the nearby Catoctin Mountains. I suppose it's a grand place to live if you don't, uh, grand place to be if you don't have to live there. Now, this weekend, there'll be an old friend, Winston Churchill, staying with Ike, and I'd be interested to know if Winnie goes padding about the upstairs halls with only a bath towel tied around his middle as he did in the Roosevelt days. What about that, Earl? <laughs> when he shocked Mrs. Is, Roosevelt one is, time by walking around... Uh, is Winnie going up to Camp David? Well, uh, he's that's been up there before. Yeah, he likes to get away from humidity. And it, it was a, one of the oddest things. He was there during the war. that just occurs to me. It was a hush-hush thing. Nobody knew anything about where he was until some little girl that saw him wrote to her, con her country paper in her weekly column that she saw Sir Winston Churchill up there. That was the giveaway. Well, you have been listening to Keys to the Capitol, brought to you transcribed by NBC News, as a way of taking you behind the doors of official Washington with NBC's top reporters and commentators. Tonight, you have heard David Brinkley, Richard Harkness, Earl Godwin, and Ray Scher. Keys to the Capitol will be brought to you at this same time each week. This is the NBC Radio Network.